Okay, we're back live in Oracle Open World 2012. This is SiliconAngle.tv, SiliconAngle.com. It's a cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events, extract the signal from the noise, and I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, and it's always good to have Oracle, ex-Oracle uh, executives on, especially guys who built product. Um, and we have another one here. I'm John Furrier, I'm joined with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org, and we're here with Dheeraj Pandey, who is uh, one of the co-founders and CEO of Nutanix. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. Welcome back. Yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> we had a great chat at Oracle Open World. Uh, uh, VMworld. I mean VMworld, I mean World. Uh -huh. A little late in the day. We're here. at Oracle oh, uh, Open World. We're at Oracle Open <laughs> World. <laughs> Where are we? Uh, IBM Edge? No, no. Um, at VMworld. Um, you've been in the business for a while. Ex-Oracle. So you know Oracle. You know what they, how they operate. Larry's doing his thing. What's your take on his keynote Sunday and uh, his posturing, and wh where is he taking this? Uh, yeah. You know, I've had a uh, healthy respect for this company, and uh, maybe because I've actually worked here in the past. I tend to look at uh, Fortune 500 uh, as wealthy people, and the folks who actually serve them are the like the private wealth managers. Uh, <laughs> when you have when you have 50 plus million dollars uh, in your bank, you don't get excited about Scott's trade or E-Trade or $7 transactions. You're looking for a UBS heavyweight or you're looking for a Credit Suisse heavyweight or a gold medal. White gloves, yeah, yeah treated well, it's about massage. The it's all yeah. about the trust. And Fortune 500 is that kind of a white club where I think this, you know, these uh, usual suspects, the top seven, Oracle, EMC, Microsoft, and uh, IBM and VMware and all these companies actually play, companies play, you know? Uh, so I think, you know, he's, playing it for the right audience, you know. It's about trust, it's about the portfolio, it's like, well, we can do everything for you, and we've never failed you in the past, and we never will. A uh, company like ours, you know, I tend to look at ourselves as uh, the up-and-coming hedge fund, which has the best algorithms in town. And <laughs> micro, not, a not a micro VC, <laughs> for sure, not a micro <laughs> VC. Yeah, so, you know, yeah. uh, our software makes it look like we have a portfolio as well, we can manage it in real time, high frequency trading this, and ETFs that, and emerging markets, everything, you know. But at yeah. the end of the day, a wealthy guy is not going to come to a hedge fund directly. Yeah, yeah I mean, we, we, you know, we're critical of Oracle, only because it's fun to do that, and, and you know, because we're small time compared to Larry. We like to throw the punches at Larry once in a while, but you know, as I said on Twitter, I was also you know, giving him props, because big companies can be laggards fast. Larry, punches, he's, he moves. Absolutely. I mean, he's not afraid yeah, yeah. to see something yeah, cross the chasm absolutely. and saying, you know what, this is going to affect my business. Yep. I'm going mean, to be competitive the, the, and I'm going to compete and change. Yeah, I mean, I, I call uh, him and Joe as the secular guys in this industry. They have no religion. They're kind of uh, the atheists. Yeah. You know, Larry said uh, early on in maybe the late 90s and early 2000s, we'll never acquire our way into technology. We'll build he was building apps for 16 years until he decided to say, you know what, enough is enough. We're going to buy people soft and get our way into applications the other way, right? Yeah. The same person who said never acquire is the guy who's saying we'll go and acquire 35, 40 billion dollars worth of assets in the next yeah. 10 years, right? I he mean, then said he'll never be in hardware. Now you see all the hardware. Church, their church is uh, survival and serving the customers. Absolutely. If you look at Joe and Larry in particular, very customer centric sales-oriented, technology-based yeah. yeah. companies. And, and the, as the most important thing, no religion. You know, EMC had no religion. If you look at any company that had religion, SGI and NetApp and you know, Sun, they had a lot of religion. Sun was like, oh, it's all about the spark. It's not about the spark, it's about the winds of change. You got to know exactly what's uh, popular with the x86. You know, SGI was like that. NetApp was all about Waffle. When EMC said, you know what, well, let's acquire companies, right. but let's not try to integrate them with our DART or whatever yeah. else that we actually. You're right. The, the industry's littered with. Uh, so companies Larry, that Larry have just came off religion. a CNBC interview and he said, uh, denied having any interest in large acquisitions. This is just today, just now. Rules out a NetApp acquisition. I don't know where that came up, but uh, <laughs> it came up on Twitter on Sunday night, uh, which we were kind of going back and forth. And it kind of makes sense. You look at the size of NetApp. If they continue to, if they don't stay up, they could be a target. So uh, we were speculating on that. Dave doesn't think so. He defended Mark Hurd, stood by his side, uh, and then you know, still critiqued HP. Um, said it hurts in running Oracle. Obviously, he's a great operator. They've got a big machinery to run. Um, how do you guys look at the big guys? Um, so Larry, you, you guys are the, are the classic sil Silicon Valley or technology startup. You know, you build some technology, you start out as, you know, not a hedge fund, but now you're kind of a hedge fund because you've got more portfolio, but you're rising up. So as a rising up, you've got to dance under the elephant's feet. And Watch that. So, as the as the co-founder and CEO, how do you how do you do that? Sure. One and uh, what are some of the things that you're using to help you grow your business? Sure. 
I mean, if you look at it, we're also building an engineered system like Exadata, like Exologic, like VBlock, except that it's an engineered system for the masses. You're saying engineered systems don't need to be big iron, and they don't need to start at half a million bucks. They can start at sub 100K, and you can keep going and adding to the stuff. So we're in a similar space, except that our customer base is the global 10,000, right? And I think that's where we'll go and- How big? Uh, global 10,000, right? Okay, got it. Uh, so it's going to be the mid-market, and then eventually we'll rise up to Fortune 500 in the next two years. It takes a brand, it takes a Gartner report or two to come out, but these are real laggards, you know I mean? Even the product adoption curve, you know, yeah, the, yeah. the early majority and the late you majority. You can't just laggards. jump to eating the lunch of Oracle. You got to kind of nibble away at breakfast, you know, and then move your way into Absolutely, the market, right? Yeah. Start low. Absolutely. And I said, you know, as a hedge fund, you know, we, have, we might have the best algorithms in town, but you never are competing with the UBS wealth manager. You're saying, well, they have a portfolio, they've had this thing going for the last 200 years. There's something in it for them. And as long as they're agile, I think Oracle is and EMC is, they're agile companies, they'll actually survive the winds of change that actually So come. you guys just had a fresh round of funding, so let's talk about the company, your company. So you got some fresh funding, how has that changed the company and, and the mission that you're on right now? Um, any changes, any acceleration in your plans, any new stuff happening? It's interesting you say that, you know, we had a board meeting uh, a month ago and the board said, keep doing more of the same, which means spend more. You know, and uh, <laughs> at the end of the day, uh, they're like, well, you guys have been so good at taking risks. You know, because yeah. we've done some, some things impossible. Three years of being in business, we incorporated exactly three years ago. And uh, we've done more business in three quarters of selling. Uh, more so, like eight to nine quarters of Palo Alto, data domain, riverbed, we've done more business than that. Uh, so now the feedback has been tremendous and we have to go and put a lot of feet in the ground. So the next uh, 12 months, you'll see this company really bloat in size and become really big for the right reasons, all for the right reasons. We have to cover a lot of ground, a lot of, and we have large swaths of territory that are completely unmanned today. So Li Lightspeed was your main VC? Lightspeed, Kosla, uh, Goldman Sachs, and Battery. Who did the A Series A round? Lightspeed, Lightspeed did the Series A They also A did Data Stacks. We just, they had them on as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, Lightspeed portfolio is looking really good right now because uh, they were not swayed by the, you know, Pretty Girl, which was a consumer tech for like the last yeah. two, three years. They yeah. stayed with the religion, which is infrastructure for them. Yeah. And they have some really good companies in the portfolio today, including, yeah. you know, us and Nimble Storage and Data Stacks. And uh, even, you know, companies like Nest, you know, it's like, you know, who would think of Nest, Nest as being yeah. an infrastructure company? But so, it you, is. so you're talking about the Fortune 1000, you service the, the global 10,000. At the same time, these, Customers, they don't buy from you because they want to, they buy from you because they have to. So why do they have to buy from you? What is it about Nutanix that makes it so compelling? I think there are a few things that we go and talk about. One is, uh, look, engineered systems is all about simplicity. And simplicity means usability and supportability and affordability. The fact that you can start small, you don't have to make a mega decision of a million dollars before you can really go and do something and you can grow the same system over time. So I think that's actually a big killer. The way people got endeared to Salesforce, because they said, well, I can pay by the month, by the user, and I can shrink by the user by the month, is exactly what's going to happen in infrastructure as well. People will say, why can't I grow a month at a time? Why can't I grow $20,000 at a time? As opposed to having to grow half a million dollars at a time, and then making the systems be unused for half the time or more before it really fills up. So I think that key message around what the infrastructure of the next generation will look like is resonating really, really well. And now while we focus on uh, you know, the global 10,000, we will uplift ourselves to global 500. You'll see that in the next 12 months. Because you know, as we go over the hump of the bell curve of adoption, you know, we'll go to late majority and laggards, our architecture is beautifully built for that because we can scale to very large number of machines which is exactly what big companies are looking for. They want to start with 100 nodes and go to 1,000 nodes, and nobody can touch us in that, nobody. So, Deary, take us through the, um, the perspective of who you're disrupting as a startup, because you got to do a little bit of disruption, you know, to keep on pushing and spending and growing and, and grow, uh, creating more business. Um, and then how does that relate to Oracle Open World here? Sure. Your role and your relationship with Oracle, you, you know a little bit what's going on there, and how does that all tie together? So everybody's heard of Netiza and Teradata and now Exadata. Uh, these are like engineered systems uh, for analytics and databases. Then came VBlock, which was an engineered system for virtualization. Uh, what's common among all of these? They're all big iron systems. They're all engineered big iron systems. We're saying engineered systems don't need to be big iron. 
They can start small and can grow as you go, right? So today in the field, we see a lot of EMC, a lot of NetApp, a lot of Cisco, because you're not just a storage appliance, we are a data center in some sense, right? Which starts at a $80,000 uh, street price and then goes in from there. So we block and tackle a lot of server guys and storage guys together. Now, why are we winning? I think uh, part of it is because we're going and selling to the cloud guys, the virtualization guys, the application guys, who basically want a shadow IT. They're like, you know what? I don't want to deal with my storage guy and my you know, networking guy and so on. If I have a problem, I pick up the phone and I call Nutanix, right? In fact, the next step from Nutanix is Amazon. So if you are aspirational about owning your hardware, you'll buy a system like Nutanix, which is engineered, it's factory stitched, it is extremely- You don't have to overbuild. Pardon? There's not a lot of overbuilding and provisioning. Absolutely. That's the key advantage. Absolutely. That's why the cloud guys like Absolutely. it, right? And it's also usability, like you know, uh, Blackberry was a smartphone, and so was iPhone. At the end of the day, you know, you could have various kinds of engineered systems, One of them, some of them very clunky to use, some of them very easy to use. And I think we've spent a lot of time on those things as well, which perhaps becomes an afterthought for a lot of infrastructure companies. It's about, so for uh, the CIOs out there and the uh, innovative IT guys who are looking at their infrastructure saying, hey, you know what? We got some blue sky ahead of us, you know, the dark ages of our, our past, we got some you know, growth, we, we've done some consolidation in the center, we've taken our medicine, now we want to kind of regrow. We don't want to screw with the existing systems, uh -huh. so we got that there, but I got some playground to, to work with. That was classically Amazon or something else. What do you, want, what do you share with them about the, the dynamics of that and, and with specifically your product and other things? What's your advice to those groups? How should they look at that? What's their personnel packages look like? And uh, what strategy they should take? Sure. So the first thing we actually go and even figure out is if these guys are too small, then I think it's not worth it for us. If they're like S in the SMB, with about 50, 100 employees, there's no CIO there. They might not even be director of IT, right? But if it's an interesting company, the M in the SMB, or even Global 500. Like 5,000 employees? Yeah, yeah, I mean, not, not even 5,000, it could be 200, actually. It's interesting enough, because they have a director of IT who has to go and own some hardware on premise. Okay, got you know, it. They can't have virtual desktops lie in Amazon, or they can't have, uh, you know, things like exchange cluster lie in Amazon just yet because it's not prime time ready for SLAs and performance and reliability just yet, right? So anybody who wants to own on-premise hardware uh, will have to think whether they want to build it the old way with uh, blade chassis, diskless blades, uh, Cisco networking gear and a storage appliance or they want to look at it in a new way which is engineered from the factory and all the complications of IT are taken care of by Nutanix. So you, you're one phone call away from, hey, the infrastructure has problems. In fact, we go on to say, we'll take care of a VMware problem, we'll take care of your VMware It's like on-premise cloud. Absolutely, absolutely. Drop it on-premise for security reasons, yeah, security but you guys are tied directly in for cost of ownership. Yeah, and, and security, compliance, SLAs and performance, and which uh, one of the very subtle points is tax depreciation. So capital depreciation over three years is, for a lot of people, still is very meaningful. Because they're saying, you know, if I, I like the OPEX part of it, but if I could own the hardware, then three years later I can actually get capital depreciation. And it's very tax friendly for me. It's not the same with Amazon, actually. Yeah, it's a nice nuance to have there. But the, it's a nuance that they can really plays sure. into your sales. Absolutely. And I think a lot of people uh, just believe that they can do it better if it's a smaller cloud, as opposed to being lost in a million servers and not knowing where you're running, you know, why it's slow and stuff like that. Amazon is still a developer-friendly cloud. It is not built for IT guys just yet. I think it will happen over time as you see more uh, maturation in this market. You know, But I think in the next three years, people who want to believe in the tenets of distributed data infrastructure, one of the things that you actually brought about last time. So one, one area we're doing a lot of research in, Dave and I and our team, is um, software-led infrastructure. So we're trying to take this convergence notion of server, storage, and compute. I mean, no, server, server and compute, storage and networking, collapse it together, yeah, it's the classic convergence. But now with the Nasira we talked about at VMworld is now software-defined networking is the rage. Now the marketing of that is software-defined data center. So that's going to be a hot trend, it's going to change some things, there be some nice things under the covers. How does that affect your business? Does it affect your business? Um, how much software is involved in what you guys are doing in the build-outs? And how relevant is it to the customer base right now? Uh, I think it's a great question. In 2010, when we were actually converging compute and storage, uh, pretty much everybody was a naysayer. They said, you know, you guys are smoking, because you know, storage belongs to a separate group, yeah. service belongs <laughs> to a separate group. And they had the Fortune 500 prism in their mind. They were looking at it from the point of view of Fortune 500. 
territories, boundaries. They didn't see Hadoop coming. They didn't see Accelerator coming. They didn't see a lot of that stuff coming. Yeah, yeah. 2011, a lot of those uh, naysayers became fence sitters because they started to see Fusion IO on the server side. They said, hey, storage is serious business on the server side as well. But now, how do you make it enterprise grade? Yeah. Same guys in 2012 were now like flocking together and, and like mobs and saying, this is the next generation. Now, big data stuff. analytics is the hottest thing you can, Absolutely. can do. Absolutely. And not just that, the fact that what you could do for big data is true for virtualization as well, for private cloud as well, is actually the eye opener for these guys. Uh, so I think, um, uh, you know, before Paul left EMC, you know, the Nicer uh, sorry, uh, uh, VMware, yeah. uh, there was a Wall Street uh, interview. He said, you know what, data centers are going to look all homogeneous. They're going to all look like commodity x86 servers, and everything is going to run inside of them, and it's going to be all software. So they were doing it for compute and memory. Uh, with Nicera, they want to do it for networking. And storage is the last frontier. So, you know, in the last three years, you know, my uh, co-founding partner Mohit, you know, who has uh, the DNA of Google File System, he's actually built a system that is all software. So we are not tied to anything in hardware at all. Now that doesn't mean that we have to ship software. There's, it's one thing to say that you're not beholden to a supermicro hardware box yeah, or yeah. a quantum. You've something. got some portability. Absolutely. And if the price so changes on the hardware, you know, RAID and uh, fault tolerance and clustering and snapshots, cloning, the DR, all that stuff, journaling, all that stuff is in pure software. Now it's more painful to actually build such systems, but it's the right way for the, of the future, you know, I think. So you've got this hybrid, from a storage standpoint, you've got flash, you've got spinning disk, you're saying essentially we don't really care, whatever the customer wants, wherever the industry trend goes, we can manage that. But talk about, so one of the things John mentioned was the software-led software infrastructure. And we've put forth this vision where all active data is going to be on Flash, and you got the Bitbucket. We're not the only ones to talk about the Bitbucket, but I think the, the thing that we've really focused on is the metadata management. So can you talk about how you manage that metadata and where the right place to do that is? And you know, is it you, is it VMware, is it who? Great point. I think uh, you know, it's a good thing you asked this question because uh, one of the uh, biggest uh, cornerstones of what we build the big component is the metadata, because you're going to manage a lot of data, and uh, in even the early Hadoop systems or uh, Google file systems, they they were constrained by one metadata server, that mm -hmm. one big machine, one big iron, and it became a single point of failure, a single point of bottleneck. Hadoop stuttered till about two months ago, until Hadoop 2.0, where the name node was a single point of yep. failure, a single right. point of bottleneck, Use right? that and you're uh, so Mo over. Mohit, our CTO, from day one was very clear because he had seen Google file system. He's like, well, you don't want to go through the pains one more time. Yeah. Metadata has to scale at the same rate as data. You add a node, you should balance your metadata as well as balance the data. So if you have 100 nodes, your metadata runs on 100 nodes. If you have 1,000 nodes, your metadata runs on 1,000 nodes. And with some very clever techniques, you can actually scale it to a point where even at 5,000 nodes, you don't have a problem. because. One of the key things about metadata scaling is when you add a node, does everybody have to change to redistribute some of the parts of the metadata to, to this new node? So you eliminate any kind of coherency issues by spreading the metadata on all the clusters? Yeah, and I think uh, there's a step further than that, that we are completely lockless. So you don't have to take locks or do any kind of uh, distributed transaction like the tra uh, SQL database had to, uh, had to do in yeah, the yeah. last 15 years of two-phase commit right. and locks and things like that. And these are key elements to scaling the metadata. And so where should it belong? I think, uh, uh, can it belong in VMware? I think VMware has been managing some form of metadata for the last 10 years with its VMFS, but they're very limited. You know, for them, a metadata unit is a megabyte or more in terms of the block mm -hmm, size. Mm -hmm. The interesting stuff has to be at four kilobytes, eight kilobytes, can you do deduplication, encryption, compression, at such fine boundary. And when you do such uh, fine boundary metadata uh, kind of, uh, expression, then you have to scale it to hundreds of terabytes, even petabytes of metadata. Say outside the channel. Sorry? Outside the channel. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, we, in fact, would uh, look at VMFS and it cringe if you're like, wow, what have they built in the last 10 years? It doesn't scale, it's built for block, it's not. So finally, NFS was actually one of the saviors of VMware. In fact, uh, NetApp worked with VMware yeah, very yeah. closely, and in fact, it enabled virtualization to become simple again. Mm -hmm. Right, because they were very block-based Absolutely, biased. and it was study reservations, yeah. a lot of arcane technologies of block. It was block good for EMC for a while, though. It was, yeah. and I think it drove <laughs> a lot of business. But in fact, it's better for EMC now because no uh, VMware, as a stock price, 
has done even better because it's simpler to use and simpler yeah. to manage and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So, so we're big fans of you guys. But when we like the, the content you have as, as an executive, you're awesome. You've got a world class uh, company you're building. So that's fantastic. Um, but for the folks out there who aren't, haven't been following Nutanix or aren't inside the ropes or inside baseball, as they say, why are you guys doing so well? Explain to the folks out there why you're such a hot company. Um, one thing is uh, obviously the product market fit. Uh, from day one, we made a bold call. Sometimes bold calls can basically go down like there's no tomorrow. Like, and for us, it was the other way around where every year there was more validation. You know, it started out with our conviction of a collapsing computer storage. 2011, it was about Fusion I.O. 2012 is about software defined storage. So everything is actually falling into place from the point of view of the demand from the market. And you couldn't have asked for better. You know? I mean, we never had to pivot. If anything, the story has only uh, sounded better and better every day. Like, wow, you guys are doing this. 10 gigabit networks is in vogue, and it's about software-defined 10 gigabit networks. All that stuff is actually pointing towards... So really the product and the team, the team's solid, right? But the, but the other thing is about the culture. And I think I want to say something, it's, it sounds very cliche to talk about culture, but uh, Mohit and I, you know, my CTO, uh, co-founding partner and I, are extremely uh, grounded. We are paranoid. We understand the value of the big seven guys and know that they are private wealth managers and there's no point actually really competing with them. But we can roll up our sleeves and do everything and anything. You know, I think in the first year, I wrote, I wrote a lot of code uh, to actually get this company off the ground. Now, a lot of that code is not perhaps used because they have gone and made it better. <laughs> but uh, I, <laughs> that's good, though. In a way, you know, hum, you know, pat yourself yeah. on the back, but then you just say, "Hey, that's a good thing." Yeah, but but you know, yeah. the two of us wisely spend the money. We have come this far in a uh, little over twenty million dollars uh, in three years, as opposed to spending six years and fifty million dollars. So uh, everybody is fresh. They all believe that we can build a very large company from here. Most employees are less than a year old. The investors are less than a year old, except for Lightspeed. So there's a lot of belief. Uh, How many employees you have now? 112, 113, 112. it's going to go to about 200 in the next six to nine months. So you're expanding, you're hiring, okay, get that plug in there. Um, we got the, uh, we're getting the break sign, but I wanted you to just end out on the following, uh, answer the following uh, question. Every company has a unique culture DNA. It's Moore's Law for Intel, it could be sales, sales for another company, customer service for another. What's the one thing about your culture that you and your co-founder can point to and say, hey, you know, at Nutanix, we're, fanatic about blank, fill in the blank. What is that uh, culture feature? I would say two things, if you were to give me the luxury of saying two things. Yeah, sure. One yeah. is uh, quick decisions. Uh, so Mohit and I are tied at the hip and we don't let things fester for too long. And uh, secondly, respect for every individual in the company. You know? It's like, you know, the support guys are just as important as the sales guys who close deals. And, you know, we, uh, we reached a very big milestone just about a week ago in terms of bookings. You know, our support guys cut the cake because had it not been for them, it would not have actually gone that far. So it's the respect for every individual that actually comes to so much. All right, cool. Dheeraj Hunde uh, from Nutanix, CEO, co-founder, uh, great culture, great entrepreneur. Uh, we love having you on theCUBE because uh, you know, you're, you're one of us, you've been around the block and seen a few cycles and have great commentary. So uh, uh, when you sell the company or you go public or retire, you're the opening <laughs> on theCUBE anytime. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we'll be right back uh, with SiliconANGLE TV with our next guest.